Hello there you gorgeous lot, Adam Cleary from 442 here, and by the time you've watched this video, if it's like the day after I make it, one of two things will have happened. Either England will have been crowned under 21 European champions and a glittering tournament for them will have ended with silverware, or they'll have been beaten in the final and an otherwise spectacular tournament will still have been pretty good. But as it stands right now, I'm recording this the day before the final when they have got there without conceding a single goal and are getting more than a couple of eyebrows raised across Europe because of how good they are. Now, yes, there's a lot of Premier League experience in here, which obviously does help, but to a man, every single one of them is playing with a style and with a control and with an intelligence and with a flair that is making them look like one of the best put together outfits across the world at this level. And that's weird, isn't it? What were the odds of that happening? England turning up at an international tournament with an entire squad who all read the game really well, have got positional flexibility, are technically brilliant on the ball. How's that happened? Well, deliberately, as it turns out, and very, very slowly. So first off, if you've not watched England at this tournament and the final hasn't happened yet, then you absolutely should. And if it has happened, you should go back and watch some of it because they're dead good. We've got them sort of nominally set up in a 4-4-2 here because that's just the easiest way to sort of explain it. But it's not really a 4-4-2, it's kind of a 4-2-3-1 and it's also lopsided and players move around and it's really, really clever. But crucially, while I've got the players overlaid here who started the semi-final against Israel, arguably their best performance in my opinion, they've actually used loads of different players throughout this tournament. Nani Mandwige's play, Oliver Skip's played, Cameron Archer's played, Jacob Ramsey's played, they've had to change the left back because of injury a couple of times, they've almost used the entire squad in this tournament. But for the purposes of the Israel game, we've got Anthony Gordon and Morgan Gibbs-White up front, but neither of them play as the nine, Gordon drops into the wide spaces and also drops off the front, Morgan Gibbs-White sort of occupies these areas, but he's not afraid to get into the channels and play in there. Emil Smith-Rowe, he's over here on the left-hand side, but he's actually the number 10. This normally allows whoever's playing left back to push right the way up and they get this sort of attacking front five. We've got Cole Paul Palmer over on this side, who tends to hold the width, but really comfortable coming inside and putting in crosses. He got one for Morgan Gibbs White, who scored a header in that game despite being about five foot three or something ridiculous. That's how good his movement was. That's how good they were at creating the space. Uh, who else? You might forget. Curtis Jones. He's a really versatile player. He joins up with the players in the middle, but he gets out and he fills in the little gaps around the side. Isn't afraid to go and provide width on the right if he's needed. All of them, as I'm sure you can see, are incredibly, incredibly flexible in what they're doing. Also got James Garner, a right back, who is essentially midfielder because he can then invert, get in the middle, help with the build-up and give them an overload in the centre of the pitch. And they haven't got to worry about leaving a massive gap over on the right-hand side because if somebody needs to go there, anyone will just go there. The second goal against Israel is just the perfect example of this. Like if we just freeze it here, which is as they're getting into the attacking third and overlay what positions all these players are nominally supposed to be playing, you can see the positions mean nothing to these boys. Morgan Gibbs-White has dropped off the forward line to receive the ball. He's now driving towards goal. He gets Emile Smith-Rowe with a 1-2 pass that allows him to drive into the box. Emile Smith-Rowe's now moved into the right-hand channel to provide a bit of width. Garner was the player who had the width originally, so the Israeli fullback stuck with him and left the space wide open. He gets the cut back and everybody's expecting Gordon to be the recipient of the ball but he pulls the defenders away and that leaves room for Palmer to come in and score. Now win or lose in the final, which they very well could, Spain are an excellent side, this is still clearly a team that's got incredible potential. So what's happened? Is it a, is it a golden generation? Have we got loads of generational talents coming through? No. Nobody here is being talked about the way Bellingham is, for example. This is just the kind of standard we tend to expect an England youth team to be. What I mean about this group being different is there seems to be a real consistent theme throughout the squad of all of these players having a high level of footballing intelligence and on-pitch versatility. Almost as if, you might say, there's some kind of template for an English footballer these days where certain values and certain attributes have been identified as being incredibly important and coached into all these players from a young age regardless of what kind of academy or what kind of level of football they grew up in. Almost as if it's in their DNA. And to tell this story, we have to go all the way back to 2009, to England's last appearance in an under-21s European Championship final. Actually, technically, we should go back another 10 years on top of that to when Howard Wilkinson, remember him, sat down with the FA and went, Football's gonna change really soon. It's gonna change really dramatically, and you need to change with it. And the FA went, Nah, it's probably not, so no we won't, but it took until 2009 for them to realise that he was right. And what happened in 2009 was that a hotly rated England under-21 side featuring lots of players with Premier League experience who are all going to go on to have glittering careers allegedly 
faced Germany in the final of that tournament and got absolutely humiliated. And it isn't surprising looking back, because that German side had Manuel Neuer, it had Jerome Boateng, Mats Hummel, Sami Khedira, Mesut Ozil, some players that went on to play the very, very top level for their entire careers. And that England team had Lee Catamull. And the thing is, if we just look at that England 11 here, hang on, I'll get them all set up, it really does represent all those sort of core footballing philosophies that we thought of as quintessentially English, but that the rest of Europe has already long since moved away from. Like, you've got a midfield three here of Muamba, Noble, and Catamull. Three honest pros who are steely in the tackle and won't give an inch and win the ball really well, but God bless them, there's not really an ounce of sort of technical intelligence anywhere there. Like, it was genuinely those three in the middle of the park versus Hummels, Kadira, and Ozil. And even up top, you've got James Milner, who at the time was still seen as a conventional winger who was going to hold the width, who was going to get to the byline and get those crosses in, and Adam Johnson, who will say absolutely no more about, and Theo Walcott down the middle, because Theo Walcott was a big-name player. Did he fit that system? No, but he'd already been to the 2006 World Cup, and everybody thought he was going to be really good, so in he goes. You want to start from that big final? England had one shot on target in the entire game. And yet somehow this still wasn't a wake-up call to the FA, by the way. The gulf in class between Germany, a nation that was prioritising having an established route through to the senior national team and had this sort of inbuilt philosophy about how they wanted their players to be coached versus just the England team that had Premier League Academy players in it. The gulf in class was still not a wake-up call to them. That would not arrive until 12 months later at the 2010 World Cup, where once again... England played Germany. And lo and behold, in the starting 11 for Germany that day was Manuel Neuer in goal and Mesut Ozil and Sami Khedira in the midfield, as well as several other members of that under-21 squad littered throughout the team. And for England was James Milner. Now, this game was, yep, okay, you're one step ahead of me. It was Germany 4, England 1. It's a game that exclusively gets talked about because of that Frank Lampard goal that had crossed the line but wasn't given. What doesn't get talked about, though, was that even if that had gone in, Germany could have scored in seven or eight goals here if they'd wanted to. Germany were playing that nice, new, shiny, exciting 4-2-3-1 system that gave you so many movement options and chances to create overloads and get players in behind. In England, we're playing... 4-4-2. And not even a good 4-4-2, by the way. They had Barry and Lampard in centre midfield. Gerrard narrowly tucked in on the right. Milner over there being the winger and Rooney and Defoe with no real plan for how to use Rooney and Defoe up top. Fabio Capello, for all he gets a lot of stick, wasn't stupid. He knew Germany would have a man advantage in the middle, so he played Gerrard sort of in this half-left, half-central idea, so when England were out of possession, he could come in and help out with the defending and contesting the ball. And when they're in possession, he could get out into wide areas and use his right foot to try and get players in behind. Smart, sensible, match them up three in the middle, but this is what matching that Germany team up three in the middle actually produced. And that's not even one of the goals. The goals were all somehow... In fact, actually, look at this. Look at this for a second. Draw a line on. That's England's back four when the second goal goes in. That's the line they were holding. Now, while the FA was sort of willing to just let the under-21s final go, because, well, it's just the under-21s, the fact that so many players from that game had then turned up at the senior level and humiliated England even worse a year later was finally the wake-up call they needed to do something. And that's something, part led by Dan Ashworth, who's now at Newcastle United, was the England DNA idea and the St. George's Park facility. Now, weirdly, they had actually started construction on this facility about... About 10 years prior when Howard Wilkinson was banging the drum that they needed to do something but it started getting expensive and then Wembley was costing a lot of money then they weren't even sure what they were going to use it for so it ended up just getting put on the back burner and completely forgotten about it until until Mesut Ozil did this to Gareth Barry. So stirred into action by having their heads promptly flushed down the toilet in South Africa, they got it finished and it opened two years later. And the whole idea behind it, or specifically the idea of the England DNA thing, was that they were going to identify key traits, key qualities that could be coached into players and start doing that from the youngest possible age so that when some of these players potentially got to a level where they could represent the nation either at youth level or even at senior level, they all had an intrinsic set of tools that would make them really versatile, really skilled, and really adaptable footballers. And the thing is, they said at the time in 2010, this is not a project that's going to bear fruit anytime soon. This is going to get worse because we've neglected the national setup for so long before it gets better. And they 
were bang on. England went out in the group stage of the next World Cup and then were binned out of the Euros by Iceland of all teams just after that. And just to show you how much things have changed since then, here are some of the actual slides from the England DNA presentation. Everyone going into St. George's Park at every level, men's teams, women's teams, youth teams, senior teams, they are part of this. Talks about how England need to prioritise being as good out of possession as they are in possession, how to recognise transitions on the pitch and either exploit them or cover for them as necessary, how players should be tactically flexible as well as having a number of different positions they can play in. And what does that description sound a lot like to you? This England under 21 team. The FA said it might take 10 years for this program to bear fruit and here we are 11 years after they started it with a team that absolutely exemplifies all of these characteristics. And you'll notice as well there's nothing in this presentation about steely determination and grit and never say and die and getting it up them. It's about understanding what modern football is and producing modern footballers. And that is how England have created this really exciting team that is currently at the under 21 Euros. Now as I say this video is probably going out the day before so if they've been spectacularly beaten I'm going to look slightly silly but bear in mind that the journey to get there says an awful lot about how good they've become win or lose and of course if they did win then I just didn't mean a single word about it being the journey and not the destination I never doubt with them for a second they're mint. Anyway, right, yes, that's it from me. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much if you are a subscriber. We actually did hit 400,000 subscribers between the last two videos, which I, I said might happen, but I didn't think would happen. So honestly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And if you're not a subscriber, but you've enjoyed this video or any we've done previously, then please do consider subscribing. Like, it takes you a little second, you press the thing, we send the video straight to you, and it does genuinely help us out quite a bit. In the meantime, though, as ever, thank you so much for watching. I have been Adam Cleary. Please get me on all the socials now, at Adam Cleary, C-L-E-R-Y, Twitter, I'm funny there, Instagram, I'm emotional there, and threads. I haven't decided on my identity there yet. We'll see how it goes. And if you just can't get enough of England at international level content, then please do pick up the latest issue of the 442 magazine with England's Lionesses ahead of their World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. They are our cover stars. We have big interviews with them. It's a really, really good magazine time. In the meantime, though, it's, this was far too long an outro. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.